Welcome everyone for our September History Talks. This is a program of the South Dakota State Historical Society and specifically um, the Research and Publishing Program in South Dakota Historical Society Press and the South Dakota Historical Society Foundation. And I'm Deidre Berzer. I am the director of the South Dakota Historical Society Press. And I have with me our managing editor, Slater Sabo, who's letting people in to the uh, from the waiting room. So hopefully everybody is coming in <laughs> right around now because I don't want anyone to miss any part of this wonderful presentation because I got to have a preview earlier today from our author, Linda Elevitz Marshall. And she is the author of the very beautiful, delightfully written Bob Marshall, Defender of the Wilderness. It's our latest children's book at SDSHS Press. We do publish about one children's book a year. That's probably as much as we can do. <laughs> children's books are, are so much fun, but they are a lot of work um, because the, the illustrations and the design and the story all have to be just exactly right to convey what the author wants to do um, and this vision. And so Linda is going to be able to tell you about her vision um, in the, the long time it got to, to ruminate around and, and all the research she did and all kinds of things like that. So I'm going to tell you just a little bit about Linda and then um, let her take it from there. Uh, if you haven't already muted you, um, I would appreciate if you muted. Um, I know sometimes unplanned things happen. People come in to talk to you that don't know you're on a program or your dog decides to bark. <laughs> Whatever, things happen. Your phone rings. Um, so please mute. And then after Linda's talk, we'll have a, a chance to do some Q&A with her. Um, I'll ask that you type out your questions in the chat box and then I'll relay them to her. So far, there are 22 of us, so um, it can get kind of unwieldy if we're all sort of trying to discuss at the same time. So that's why we do it that way. All right. So Linda Elevitz Marshall is a quite a prolific writer of children's books. She has written 24 children's books, about to sign the contract for number 25. And you can see all of her books on her website, lindamarshall.com. They're also available in all of the, the places where you normally do your book shopping. Um, we, of course, have her book for sale at sdhspress.com or available through the Heritage Store um, with the foundation, the South Dakota Historical Society Foundation on their website, which you went to to register for this event. So back to Linda. Um, she started writing books in 2010. So I'm so a book more than a book a year. That is really impressive, <laughs> extremely impressive. Um, she did lots and lots of things before she became a writer of children's books. Among them, she she was a, a sheep raiser. She owned a bookstore store. Sorry, and she raiser of sheep, not not a. <laughs> Cutting people razor. <laughs> um, she owned a bookstore. Uh, she did a lot of oral histories. She was an anthropologist. Um, she raised children. So lots and lots of things that gave her probably a, a astounding amounts of information for writing her books. So she currently and has for a long time lived in the Adirondacks and sometimes in Manhattan. Spends her time between with her husband between Adiron the Adirondacks and Manhattan. And I'm going to let Linda take it from there. Wow, Deirdre, thank you so much for that lovely introduction. I can't tell you how thrilled I am to be working with the South Dakota Historical Society Press. It's been an absolute joy. And um, I want to thank everybody there, especially Deirdre and Jean Bowman, who did the illustrations for this absolutely gorgeous, gorgeous text. And gorgeous, sorry, book. And she used my text and she brought it to life in a beautiful way. And I'm so appreciative. So if you go to Jean Bowman Illustration online or to the South Dakota History Society Press, you can find Jean's um, videos that she did on YouTube. I'm I will try at the end of this to show some to you, but I, I'm I'm not guaranteeing it because there's a 
I have some technological glitches here. So I'd like to introduce you to Bob Marshall and the Defender of the Wilderness, or what's a nice Jewish boy from New York City doing saving millions of wilderness acres in Montana um, and, and throughout the United States? So what is a nice Jewish boy from New York City doing saving all this wilderness? What a puzzle. Let's see if we can unravel it. First, we'll start at the beginning of the story with me as a little girl. And, and I'm pressing the button. Hold on. <laughs> we did this several times before, and it did work. And now I've pressed play. Oh, there it is. Sorry. Okay. Sorry. I had to... It goes to sleep sometimes. <laughs> well, I think I needed to... I was pressing through the arrow and it wasn't working. There I am. So as you can see, I like books and I like to read. Um, and then I grew up to become somebody who loved being in nature. The map that you see beside, behind me is a map of a place called Knollwood. And Knollwood is where... Bob Marshall, the subject of our story, spent his summers. That's a map that he drew by hand. It was, it's also the same topo map that you saw at the beginning. Bob loved maps and loved to draw them. So here I am, I'm in the Colorado wilderness right there. And it was gorgeous, but I kind of needed a friend to um, explore it with me. And I found one. His name is Bob Marshall, but he's not our Bob Marshall, nor is there any relationship. So I just want to get that out of the way. Um, there are lots of commonalities between the star of my show, Bob Marshall, and the Bob Marshall I wrote about, but no relationship, no familial relationship. The commonalities are both have roots in what my husband refers to as the center of the universe, otherwise known as Syracuse, New York. Um, it's a little family joke. I don't see it as the center of the universe by any means, but <laughs> um, he does. Um, both are Jewish. Both love the wilderness and, con and love saving it. So that th these similarities are what got me interested in delving deeper into the story of Bob Marshall um, of the book, because this Bob Marshall spent a lot of time in the Adirondacks at his place called Knollwood. And here we are together on an adventure. There we are, and we got married in a cabin. So I just want you to know that I, I like the outdoors. And it's a hippie wedding, rabbis wearing tie-dye, in case you can't tell. Um, that is our farmhouse in upstate New York, where we raised our four children. And those are the four children and our flock of sheep at the county fair. Here's where the Bob Marshall story begins. This is Saratoga Springs, New York. It's um, about midway between um, Long Island, which is on the southern part of New York State, and the Canadian border, to give you some proximity. It's also the gateway to the Adirondacks. It's where there's a major horse racing place um, I'm trying to give you a graphic idea of where Saratoga Springs is in case you're not familiar with it. There was an enormous hotel called the Grand Union Hotel. And for many years, a family uh, headed by a, a man named Joseph Seligman went there on vacation. They lived in New York. The Seligmans lived in New York City. And New York City in the 
late 1800s was stifling in the summer. There was no air conditioning and it was really uncomfortable. Anyone with the means got out of the city. Poor people stayed because they couldn't leave, but anyone who could got out. So in eight, I think the date was 1877, um, Joseph Seligman and his family drove up to the Grand Union Hotel and the clerk there said, I'm sorry, we can't let you in. We are no longer accepting Jews. Actually, he said, we are no longer accepting Israelites. And Mr. Seligman, who was a prominent banker, asked why and was told that the um, usage of the hotel had fallen off the previous year. And the owner decided it was because there were too many people of the Jewish faith there. And if they had fewer Jews coming to the hotel, maybe more other people would come. And so there was, they stopped allowing Jews come, to come. Other hotels in the area, other resorts, stopped allowing Jews to come. It was not well received, to say the least, by the Jewish community. Those who could purchased their own places. So here, this is a, an article that I found online about the Seligman scandal. Unfortunately, I couldn't figure out how to make it big enough to read for you to read right now. But if you look it up, it's S-E-L-I-G-M-A-N. And you can find a lot of information about that online. So Jews wound up, if they could, buying land in the Adirondacks and creating their own homes. In case you don't know what the Adirondacks looks like, here's a pond. Um, it's Long Pond, not very far from the ha home where Bob Marshall wound up spending his summers. So the place that Bob Marshall, where he spent his summers was a place called Knollwood, K-N-O-L-L, -L, there you go, W-O-O-D. And there it is. It's um, my husband and I went there one day after we had gone canoeing and it's gated and it says private. Um, I noticed it as, um, as we were on our way to our canoeing spot. And I said, Bob, look, there's Knollwood. That's where the Bob Marshall had their place. Let's go and see. And then we drove up and we saw the private property stuff. And my husband said, it's okay. Let's go in. After all, I'm Bob Marshall. <laughs> so <laughs> he drove right in. I'm like, don't do that. <laughs> but he went ahead and drove in. So um, we we went in and I'm going to, I had kind of scoped it out. It's, it's in this book, The Great Camps of the Adirondacks. And here are some photos of it. So the story about the Knollwood camp was that Bob Marshall's father, Lewis Marshall, who was a prominent attorney, in fact, he argued cases before the Supreme Court and was seriously considered as a possibility to be a Supreme Court justice. He did not become a Supreme Court justice, but he was of that caliber of lawyer. He and four other Jewish families were able to purchase the land that became Knollwood. And my Bob and I snuck in, and you're about to get a preview or a sneak peek. There you go. So that's this was all part of my research. <laughs> I mean, I was really, I wanted to learn more and more. So we we drove in and going, hello, hello. And eventually somebody helloed back. I, I tell you, I've, I felt like um, 
a little scared, like you know, we were on private property, you know, somebody could shoot us or whatever, get us arrested. It's just like pretty scary. So I'm like, hello, hello. And finally, um, when somebody helloed back, my husband said, I'm Bob Marshall. And um, and then he explained that we were interested in learning more. And we wound up meeting, uh, getting the phone number for somebody in the family, a um, man named Peter Schweitzer, not related to Albert Schweitzer, but uh, part of the Marshall family. And I contacted Peter. And later, he showed us around. And that gives you a sense of what Knollwood looked like. So I, I, it's as gorgeous as it looks. In fact, it's even more amazing. Um, Bob Marshall spent his summers there. He and his brother, George, explored. Um, one day, well, I think it was a really dark and dreary day. And I um, wish I could back up, but I think I can't. Yeah. Inside of an old dresser, Bob opened up a cabinet and he found an old map and he opened it up because I have to tell you, Bob craved real wilderness. He'd spent a summer being really, really sick. And while he was sick, he read stories of Lewis and Clark and he read them over and over and over. And he just wanted to go exploring like the olden days. He wanted to be where there was real wilderness. And when he found this map, he looked out across the lake, this is Saranac Lake, and he said, oh my goodness, right across the lake, it looks like there's real wilderness with panthers, real wilderness. So this would have been around 1915 or so. The map that he found was done by a man named Verplank Colvin or Colvin Verplank. I can't remember which name is first. And um, Bob and his brother, George, and a guide named Herb Clark, who had been hired by their parents, went across the lake, across the lake, and climbed a mountain. It was Ampersand Mountain. And they went up and up and up. It was almost like they were going to fall off the edge. There, people hadn't been climbing there. There weren't, weren't trails, but they went up and up. And uh, Bob wrote something where it sounded like Herb Clark was worried they were going to fall off the edge of the mountain. Anyhow, they made it to the top. And when they got there, they looked around and saw many, many more mountains, a high peak here and a high peak there. And they thought, let's climb them all. And so Bob, his brother George, and Herb Clark mapped out all of the peaks taller than 4,000 feet. Now, it doesn't sound like much from, you know, many elevations, but in the Adirondacks, that's pretty high. So it's 4,000 feet starting at sea level. And, um, and it's high here. These, these are very old mountains, very, very old, and they've been worn down that Geologists have had a field day studying the Adirondack Mountains. Bob and George and Herb made a pledge that they would climb all 46 of those mountains. And they did. And as they climbed them, Bob made notes. Eventually, he wrote a book that he had published through the Adirondack Mountain Club. And this is the, it was the high peaks of the Adirondacks. This, this is a facsimile of what he had, what he did. This is a 1922 centennial edition. And he listed them all. And right now there, here's the front high peaks of the Adirondacks. And there are, there's now a major organization of hikers called the 46ers. And those are people who have climbed all 46 of the Adirondack high peaks. And it was all started by our friend, Bob Marshall.
And no, I am not a 46er. I, I don't particularly like hiking. I'm a swimmer, so I'll take the flats. But um, anyway, what I read you part of this. I think I'll read you a little bit right now. So we'll get a sense of the wilderness. Bob Marshall, Defender of the Wilderness. And you can see Jean's beautiful pictures. Crash! What was that? Bob Marshall turned. As a mother grizzly charged toward him, it could tear him to shreds. He scrambled up a nearby tree in the Montana wilderness where he was hiking. Crack! The branch broke. Bob tumbled to the ground. He played dead, hoping the bear would not bother him. One minute passed, then two, then three, then four. Finally, the grizzly lumbered away. Bob was safe. He sent a telegram to his family back east. Safe in Missoula, after 10 glorious days in Selway Wilderness, letter giving details of being treed by grizzly may eventually follow. And there's our hero, Bob Marshall, loved the wilderness. We'll go back to the book in a bit. I want to tell you a little bit more about my research. So I went to, to the Saranac Free Library, and that's where the archives are kept for Bob. And um, there's a, another archive, a badge of archives, I think, in California, but these were the only ones that I used for my research. Um, Saratoga may be known to you because it was a, a um, place where a lot of people did went for the cure when tuberculosis was um, a major problem. Dr. Trudeau was the um, TB specialist, and people would take the mountain air. Um, it, that's a whole other story, fascinating one, so check it out. Um, I went down to the basement archives with my white gloves and got out box after box and received papers indicating what there's the information, what's in each box, and I studied it looking for treasures. Most of the treasures in terms of my research came from being on site, from talking to members of Bob's family, from reading the many books that he wrote. He went to Alaska, lived with the Native peoples and other Alaskans, wrote the book Arctic Village, which became a bestseller and for which he gave the money, the royalties back to the native people and villagers with whom he lived. Bob had great respect for the native peoples. And when he was working with the um, Bureau of Indian Affairs, he made sure that they were treated as fairly as he possibly could make sure he to do that. He also wrote, felt that the forests were best owned and managed by government and to protect them, the force, so, so that people could always have access. And this was another one of his books, The People's Force. Bob was a prolific writer. When he hiked, he rated, rated R-A-T-E-D, not R-A-I-D-E-D, I know, just realized the two words sound the same, his hikes. So here's one of Jeannie's wonderful pictures of how Bob grew up. The family spent um, the school year in New York City. And it was in those days, um, there was horse manure all over the street. <laughs> the houses are next to each other, as they still are. There's no longer horse manure all over the street. There's other things. Um, and um, he liked being in New York. He liked it a lot. But
But when summer came, as I said, he and his brother went to the Adirondacks. And there he learned to love the wilderness. He made the map that you see on the background behind this, that topo map, and labeled places just like Lewis and Clark. He really wanted to be an explorer, just like Lewis and Clark. And when he hiked, he labeled every hike, every one of those 46 peaks that he took. Some of them, he labeled them for N-O-V, which meant niceness of view, or A-A-P-I-V-A-C, all around pleasure, in view and climbing. But there was a problem. The wilderness that Bob Marshall loved was fast disappearing. He knew somebody had to do something about that. And so Bob went to forestry school. He earned his undergraduate degree and graduate degrees, two of them, in forestry. He was a brilliant student and a very hard worker, and, but the wilderness he loved was disappearing. He knew someone had to protect it. There were forest fires all over the place, started by trains, because their track, the uh, engines would belt out smoke and the smoke would start forest fires, and then there were cars. There were like highways being built all over and people would toss cigarettes out. So Bob wanted to save the wilderness. And there's a Jewish teaching that says, be careful not to destroy or spoil the earth. For if you do, there will be nobody after you to repair it. So I don't know if that was the teaching that inspired Bob. I do know that he studied Bible with his father regularly, or if there was something else that inspired him. But he certainly felt that it was his role to save the world. And so he set out to do that. He he also tried to figure out what makes wilderness. What's the definition? So if you want to think about it for a moment, what would you say makes wilderness. Bob studied maps of the United States, and he um, identified the biggest chunks of um, territory with no roads going through them. And he came up with criteria for wilderness, and those criteria are, one, no one lives there permanently. Two, the area is so large that to cross by foot, a person must sleep there overnight. And three, its primitive environment is preserved as much as possible. So Bob decided, if Bob wound up working with the federal government and he worked with the Bureau of Indian Affairs and he worked in um, other areas of government as well, he also realized that there were National parks and National Forest Service that were closed to people who were Jewish or not white. And Bob Marshall said, this is not going to happen in America. Our National Parks and National Forest Service will be open to everyone. The reason why those areas were closed is that there were private corporations that were operating on public lands, and those private corporations set their own rules. And so if there was a resort leasing space from, say, the National Forest, and they didn't want Jews or Blacks um, camping there, they just said no Jews or Blacks. But Bob changed those policies. He said, this is America. This cannot happen. Bob, you have to read the rest of it. I'm not going to give away the whole book. Um, But that's, uh, let me show you. This is another view of the Adirondacks, and we can be thankful 
for the wilderness we have. Um, I was there today. That's um, Pyramid Lake in the northeastern Adirondacks. And this is me and my me and my Bob. And um, you saw us both when we were much younger. Here we are in our farmhouse. We just we're, that's the day before we sold it. And I just wanted to sort of end the story there. But I have to show you what we produced. There you go. <laughs> <laughs> that's that's the whole family. So we're we're missing a couple of people, but that's almost everybody. And I thought you'd get a kick out of that. Um, and just for some final views of the Adirondacks. So there we are on a peaceful Adirondack evening. And thank goodness that there's wilderness. May there still be wilderness for our children and our children's children and their children's children. And I'm happy to take any questions and uh, answer whatever you've got. Oh, I'm supposed to show you some of my other books. Sorry, forgot. <laughs> um, here, here we go. Oh, here, if you would like to learn more about Bob Marshall's father, there is this tome, Lewis Marshall, um, very thick. I haven't read it. <laughs> Just pieces of it. But it's um, supposed to be wonderful. It's another whole project. Um, here are, this book has not come, come out yet. It is Brave Volodymyr. It's from HarperCollins, and it comes out on October 3rd. It's the story of Volodymyr Zelensky and the fight for Ukraine. This is a book that won an Adirondack Award, Mommy, Baby, and Me. It's about a dog that's whose mommy, human mommy, um, goes through a lot of changes until she has a baby. And then the poor dog, he feels left out. <laughs> Very funny. Um, this is one of the books I think is most important. Polio Pioneer. It's the story of Jonas Salk and the polio vaccine and how he came to invent it. And um, you may know that he didn't take any money for it because, um, as he said, who can, it, he couldn't. It, it was like so important for all of humankind. And he, he did it because he thought it was the right thing to do. Um, this is a book set in Guatemala about a Mayan girl who wants to weave like her mother and grandmother and great-grandmothers before her. Um, as I said, I'm trained as an anthropologist. I wrote this with a friend of mine who's from Guatemala and uh, with the hope she works with a uh, Mayan women in Guatemala and my idea was maybe through writing a book we can bring more attention to what they do and maybe um, help them get some more money so that's the funds from this go to the um, not exclusively but mostly to the women and Mayan hands um, this is Saving the Countryside, it's the story of Beatrix Potter, who um, we all know that she uh, created Peter Rabbit, but what isn't necessarily known is that the monies that she made from Peter Rabbit, she used to set aside land in the English countryside for conservation. So, um, wow, questions? That's so great, Linda. Um you didn't tell them that this is your canoe, your view from the canoe. Oh, in the picture. Right. <laughs> it is. This is my view from the canoe. Yes. View from the canoe. Yes. Recent view, right? Um, I think yeah. just that last year. Okay. I think. The, one, the, previous one was the, your, the previous one you took this morning. Right. One of your previous pictures. Yes. Right. Yeah. Right. yeah. Yes. Well, thank you so much for sharing about Bob Marshall and the Adirondacks. Um, 
it's great to have those pictures to, to the to be able to imagine based on some realism. <laughs> So if anyone has uh, questions, and maybe what we'll do is look in the chat. In the meantime, um, Linda, you told me earlier, while people are maybe thinking of their questions and putting them in the chat, you told me earlier a, a story. Oh, yeah. yeah I told you two stories. About wilderness that I think that our audience would enjoy. Okay, I, I told you two stories. I, first, it's kind of a joke. Um, it's a riddle. And the, it goes like this. Why did God create people? I'm giving you a moment to think about it. Give up. Because God loves stories. It's just, that's a riddle told by the rabbis. And the rabbis tell lots of stories. One speaks very much to Bob Marshall in the wilderness. And it's a story about a grandfather who took his grandson to synagogue with him and uh, they settled in in, in their seats and I have to tell you it was a gorgeous day settled into their seats the grandfather opened up his prayer book and started to pray and the child and I think we will call the child Bobby since we're writing about Bob Marshall so Bobby opened his prayer book and sat behind grandpa sat next to grandpa and grandpa prayed and prayed and prayed. And then when grandpa looked up, Bobby wasn't there. And grandpa got kind of worried. So grandpa looked under the seats, no Bobby. Looked in the back of the sanctuary, no Bobby. Went out to the hallway, no Bobby. Went to the bathroom. Bobby wasn't there. Grandpa was getting pretty worried. Grandpa looked at the doors. Could Bobby have gone outside? And he walked outside. He didn't see Bobby in the front of the synagogue. And he went around to the side where he knew that there were some little, little forest. And there was Bobby sitting at the edge of the forest on a rock under a tree praying and grandpa said bobby what are you doing here and bobby said i'm praying and grandpa said why did you come out here to pray don't you know god is the same wherever you are everywhere god is the same And Bobby looked at his grandpa and said, I know God is the same everywhere, but I'm not the same everywhere. And Bob Marshall was a guy who needed wilderness. I'm somebody who needs wilderness. Maybe you know or you are a kind of person who needs to go to a place of tranquility to understand what's going on in life or just, just to be, just to enjoy those tranquil spots. So those are the, some of the feelings that help me understand and get to who Bob Marshall was and why he felt this need for wilderness and and I know he got it from his parents um, his father frequently took him on walks through the wilderness and um, his father worked on the New York State Constitution he was the person who put the word what 
the words that became the phrase forever wild into the New York State Constitution. I have recently learned that the forever wild clause in the New York State Constitution is stronger than the words of the 1964 Wilderness Act and uh, protects the lands more. It, Lewis Marshall, Bob Marshall's father, understood that for clean water, which New York City requires a lot of, the forests upstate, where, which supply the waters for New York, need to be abundant. And the waters upstate in the Adirondacks and the Catskills need to be pure and clean. And so Lewis Marshall and Bob Marshall did what they could to protect the wilderness. Hope that helps. Thank you, Linda. I love that story and the way you tell it. So we've got a couple of great questions. Um, how did you first learn about Bob Marshall to start with? <laughs> well, I, I first learned because people, when we started coming to the Adirondacks, people asked my husband if he knew about Bob Marshall. And then once we were skiing, <laughs> then once we were skiing out in um, Utah, we were at, um, uh, oh, I can't remember the lodge. But anyhow, somebody, we were, there was somebody at the place where we were staying whose name was also Bob Marshall and he was from Alaska. And so they talked a lot about Bob Marshall stories. <laughs> oh, that's great. Right, and right. if you all don't know, Part of the, the wilderness, a major part of the wilderness um, that we relate to Bob Marshall is the Bob Marshall Wilderness in right. Montana. Right? And he, he yeah. did save um, on his own at least 5 million acres. Of at wilderness. least. And then in, con in conjunction with a lot of other people, um, what's that big number with the other people? It's like 9 or 11 million. And he started the Wilderness yeah. Society. Um, there's also this wonderful book. It's a compilation of his writings. And it's by James Glover, uh, Wilderness Original. Um, yeah, we also yeah. have a, a, a camp in the Black Hills in South Dakota, named for Bob Marshall. So there's there is some recognition out there of where his name shows up. Um, not enough. That's right. One of the, right. One of the things we're trying to to fix here. <laughs> More recognition. Okay. So next questions have to do with all of the the writing, the extensive writing that you do, Linda. So twenty five books is a large number. How many <laughs> ideas for stories do you have going at a time, or is it one at a time? And then um, this is. So Terry has these questions and then she thought of more. Um, how much research do you do for each book and how do you know when you've done enough? Wow. Um, research is so much fun. So there's a difference between you know, writing a fiction book and writing nonfiction. So fiction, you know, I have to like come up with the idea and develop the whole story arc and which has to happen in nonfiction too. But mostly it doesn't involve research. Although sometimes there's, there is some research. I love doing research. I can do it forever. Um, you know, it's just, sometimes it's really hands-on, like it was when I did the Bob Marshall story. Other times, like when I did this story on uh, Vladimir Zelinsky, it was all done online. So, which was also during COVID. Um, and there wasn't that much available. So I do always get an expert. So for example, for my Zelinsky story. Um, oh, let's go back to Bob Marshall for a second. I contacted everybody in his family. I could. I interviewed his niece, who has since passed, um, and great niece, and um, made contacts with as many people that I, as I could find. And I'm rather persistent. I'm also a little gutsy in terms of finding people and interviewing them. Don't forget, I have a background in anthropology which makes me nosy. So I'm a pretty good snoop. Um, and I always wanted to be Nancy Drew. So um, I'm just happy doing research and looking for clues and trying to get a good take on a story. Um, so for the Jonas Salk book, 
I was able to be in touch with Jonah's so Dr. Salk's son, Peter Salk, and he read every single draft that I wrote and um, just went through everything with a fine tooth comb. So that's been fun. I, I'm so grateful. With the Zelinsky story, there was a woman I know from New York City who I called and I said, um, Toby, I know you do something with um, Russia, Ukraine, somewhere. I, I need an expert. I need an expert and because this is what I'm doing. And she said, well, I'm happy to talk to you about it. Send me what you're doing. And so I did. And then she called me back and she said she would love to work with me and be my expert and that she happened to be the special assistant to President Bill Clinton for um, Russia, Ukraine, and the Eurasian states. <laughs> so I found my expert. Thank you. So I really work hard to, to find somebody, and I've been very lucky um, for most of my projects. I've been able to find somebody, and people have loved to help. So how do you know when you've done enough? When I'm done? Yeah. How do you, when do you call it quits on the research and start writing? You have kind of a feeling like it's time to write or? When I feel like I can internalize, if, if it's a picture book biography, it's when I feel like I can internalize that person. When I feel like I have an understanding of what Beatrix Potter was going through. When I... I think everybody who writes biography gets to this point of um, being able to channel that person. And when I feel like I can channel that person, when I've got the facts and I can channel the person so that I feel like what I'm writing was, is true to them, that's when I start writing. But, you know, I have to have all the, the information first. And in a project that I'm working on right now, there are some pieces of information that I don't have. And um, I just don't know how I'm going to get them. But I'm going to work on it. And somehow or other, I'll break through. Because it's nonfiction. So I need to find someone who can get share that information that I need or, or lead me in that direction. It's kind of a mystery. I can't tell you anymore because I haven't signed the contract. All right. Well, you we'll have to stay tuned on that one and see right. what you come up with in a yeah. year or two. <laughs> okay. So then the other part of Terry's question was, are you working on multiple things at a oh, time? Yeah. Oh, are yeah. You, <laughs> no. uh, are you, are you, she said, do you go from one thing to the next or you kind of have, yeah, a multitasking number of books happening <laughs> There's so a lot said of you started in 2010 with Bob Marshall. So you're writing on these other ones while you were thinking about him. Right. Well, he just took a long time to be birthed because <laughs> <Okay>. he's like, <laughs> um, as opposed to Beatrix Potter, who like people know about, and I had a different take on her because I talked about her saving the wilderness, the saving, sorry, um, saving the countryside. Bob Marshall is still a relative unknown. And so um, it came close to publication. So I don't know if I should tell you this, but there were other people who wanted to publish it. And then um, one company got swallowed by another and that was the end of the deal. And then I was working on other stuff and I like forgot about it, And but it was still in my back pocket. Oh, here's a good story I can share. When I had my bookstore, I used to go to Book Expo, and that's how I first came met the people from the South Dakota Historical Society Press because they SDHS Press had a booth at Book Expo, and then I just happened to ask. I said, "Would you have any interest?" And then it was like a yes. This is fabulous. So this is. That was pre-COVID, and then the world shut down. So, um, and um, BEA, Book Expo America, no longer happens. 
Yeah, it's no um, longer. No, it's thing. over. Yes. Yeah. So that yeah. was that was my, my predecessor, Nancy Kupal. Right. Who was right. There. right. So and we have a South Dakota question about Bob Marshall. Do you know if he visited South Dakota Forest? I don't know. I don't know. Oh, I'm sure he did because he made a decision that he was going to hang on, hang on. If I can find he he decided he was going to walk 30 miles in every state in America. He wanted to walk every, he wanted to get to know America and so made himself a pledge that he would walk 30 miles in every single state and i'm shuffling papers because i want to show you something when he accomplished his goal of doing that he sent out a um announcement to everyone he knew who knew of his project and said here you go i don't know if you can see that but mr roger mr robert marshall takes pleasure in Announcing that he walked 30 miles, 30 or more miles in one day for the 100th time on Sunday in Yellowstone Park. But his goal was to do it in every single state of America because he wanted to know, he wanted to understand the country. So, of course, the next question is, did he make it? Because uh, maybe our listeners don't know that that, um, he died. At age 38. Right, right. Very true. Yeah, just um heart attack, right? If I remember correctly. He had a heart attack. He was on a train. He had some, um, he kept it a secret, I think, that he had underlying leukemia. Um, mm. And, um, but he'd been ill with various things and had missed quite a bit of work and whatever, and he died on a train. It's, it is attributed to a heart attack. Um, I don't know. He never married, um, but he had, he had nieces and nephews who he adored, um, and one of whom I interviewed. And um, I, I, we can just assume it was a heart attack. He was found dead on the train. So in those short 33, 38 years, did he, do we think he made it to all the states? I think, oh, he did. He did. I, yeah. Yeah. Um, I, somewhere I have that he did it. it. His goal was to do it in every single state. And I think he did do it in every single state. And there were 48 at the time. So it would have he been probably, the, he's been well, a lot of time in Alaska. So he, he probably got that one in. <laughs> oh, yeah. He, he drew a map of the, the gates of the Arctic. Um, he explored places that he felt that there was no knowledge that anybody else had ever explored. He was a pretty amazing guy. And do you know, then, um, for the Bob Marshall Wilderness in Montana, um, was that a place that was named for him because he's he spent a lot of time there? I don't know how and when it was named. Um and I haven't been there yet. I would love to go. I'm looking forward to it. As I, I hear people forward- who've been there call it the Bob. Right. <laughs> right. Yeah. Yeah. It's actually uh, known as the Bob. <laughs> and they do have a nice foundation. Yes, they do. Yes. yes. For that wilderness. So we can all aspire to go there. Right. So if someone, if, if one of you has been there, then you're going to have to tell us on the chat or at least, or take the mute off and share. <laughs> Let us know. Or invite me. <laughs> <laughs> and if you can see, Linda's in a cabin that looks like it belongs in the West. So the because person built by a Montanan, right? <laughs> well, the person who built the cabin um, was a man named Paul Creer. And he um, was a, from the Northeast. But then he went out to Montana, lived there for quite a while, and brought the Montana style of building back east and this was the first cabin that he built using he is montana style (laughs) that's so great oh so this has been fantastic and we've learned so much not just about bob marshall but about writing children's books and about thinking about the wilderness and what it is and what it means 
for all of us when we stop to think about and to know that there are these places that are unspoiled um, and then we can see them and go there and, um, and maybe find that part of ourselves that is changes, right? When we're, we're not in a um, very fast moving built environment. So we have a lot to credit people like Bob Marshall with. Um, so you can find Bob Marshall Defender of the Wilderness at sdhspress.com or anywhere where you buy your books. Also on online at the foundation, sdhsf.org, their heritage store. Um, 